Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Kiluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Hello dear viewer, dear listener, thank you for joining us once again for this great exciting episode of Mokhobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. Always a privilege to come and inspire you and energize you as best we can. Uh, please do us a small little favor for us to continue to give you this free, powerful and life-changing content. We need your support. Please just press the subscribe uh, button there. My guest is uh, Mr. Senuelo. He's about to introduce himself. Um, welcome to the studio, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. For the benefit of those who don't know you, share your name and your background. Uh, greetings, dear viewers. Uh, my name is Mohamed Senalo. Mm. Uh, Just look at face me. Yeah. Hey. Okay. My name is Mohamed Senalo. I come from Muchudi. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm the founder of Cricket Tuition or Cricket Botswana, which is, uh, has 53 centers countrywide and one in Johannesburg. Um, I'm also an author. I've written three books, two on business, one I on I hope you brought them with you. Study skills. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring them. Okay. Yes. Sir. Um, I'm a father of three kids. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, tell us about the educational part, the the, ta the training and the academics. Um, cricket is predominantly a, an education. No, I mean your own uh, my educational background. Okay, I I I finished uh, form five and went to do BSc at university, but I ended up failing and discontinuing because I. I was I had started a business already at that time, so I couldn't balance running a business and uh, being a full-time student. So mm -hmm. it ended up costing me to fail at that time. This is the first time I've had somebody failing uh, and discontinuing and talking about it without being sad. I don't think you are sad about it at all. No, sir. It why? Is. Explain <laughs> to the viewer why you are not disappointed about your failure and your discontinuing at school. It really helped me to choose one thing to do because once there was the option of going into like studying and having a, a qualification which will open up doors for me in career, having a career. And also I wanted to do business. So I was torn in between those two options, whether I'm going to be a career person, or I'm going to be a business person. But uh, with the failure coming in, it forced me to only have one option, which was to do business full time and uh, that was the only option that I had to work on. Okay. Yes, sir. What, how did the idea for Cricket emerge and at what stage in your life? Uh, immediately when I finished uh, Form 5, I volunteered with Naledi Secondary School where I was schooling. So I volunteered to, to do guidance and counseling as a peer educator. So through that uh, peer educating, I got some students who came to the guidance office and said, uh, you have taught us study skills, you have taught us time management and everything else. We, we understand that, but we want you to help specifically help us on the subjects which is sciences and maths. So that is how, as they kept, kept on coming to the office to demand that service, that's when the idea was born that I could actually offer the service and charge them a certain fee. And then I end up making the decision to say, okay, let me start this. Mm. And the idea of tutoring was born there. How did the, uh, your family members react to the idea of quitting school and starting a business? Uh, my mother did not take it kindly <laughs> uh, because she had pressure from, from work. Her colleagues at work were like, uh, how can your, your, your son who got 45 points at Form 5 
forfeit the opportunity to go and study, uh, and the government is fully paying for this, you know. Why would he, why would he like they, they were looking at the fact that okay you, he passed very well why would he forfeit that opportunity it's just f free scholarship that is there offered by the government to every citizen so it didn't make sense to a lot of people I I would mm. not go for it how did you overcome her her opposition um I kept on uh, I would I would apply and I would get admitted back into the school but then uh, I would not apply for the sponsorship. That means even with an admission letter, without a sponsorship, I couldn't. Nothing could be done. So it, it, it happened like that for several years until the time when she saw the business uh, picking up and finding ground, and then that's when she, she just let me uh, pursue what I wanted to pursue. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the idea for now um, expanding and growing the uh, cricket as a business. Tell us about that first uh, effort and then the expansion. Um, the first school. The first school. Mm. Yes, sir. Um, we, yeah, we have a, a vision of uh, building schools the same way we have, uh, have our footprint in, in terms of tuition. And um, we have already acquired uh, land to build school. So that is, is going to be our our next move that we, we, we could transform from being a tutorial business to being a school's business. Mm. But I guess what I'm asking you is, I'm calling it a school, but I'm calling, I'm really talking about that first uh, infant stage, uh, you know, tuition business. Okay. Uh, tell us about that experience and then growing from there. Um. I would say um, we, with the tuition business because um, it has really taught us a lot and uh, the fact that it's, a, it's an unregulated business, it doesn't have any governing body overseeing it, has helped us even to grow that fast because we didn't have to go through many procedures and processes in order to, to open up new locations. And uh, that also ha gave a, our competitors an edge because the barriers of entry into our market are so easy. So everybody can just start open a tuition, tuition service the following day when they decided the following day they can open without so many barriers to enter the market. So that, that, that has also been one of the weak points of this industry. But however, it has also worked for advantage that we could grow quick, quicker mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So um, now you said you have 53 outlets. Yes, centers. Okay. Um, normally people tell me that it's, it's harder to grow at the beginning, but it's much easier once you go beyond five and so. Has that been your experience? Um, yeah. The first few years was, was the toughest with a few number of branches. I remember really the, the, the startup, we had to depend on getting loans and sometimes getting loans from individuals. And the interest was so high that everything that he was making was went back to servicing the loan. And then well, when were you using uh, micro lenders? Just individuals, someone who will just volunteer to go and get a loan and support the, or invest in the business for, for a certain interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's you how. You charge what? Like hard money, 20%, 30%? Yes, even 50%. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, we paid very high interest. Uh -huh. So how, how did you survive that? We just uh, every, we would work very hard and make as much as we can and just try to give all the money to the person so that we clear them out and mm. we don't have anything because I, I, I couldn't go for the idea of selling shares. Okay. So the, the best idea was to borrow money so that I don't lose equity at the beginning. Oh, you didn't want to, to dilute. Yes. Other people may ask you, what was the, the reasoning? Why didn't you at the startup level uh, prefer debt instead of uh, equity. Uh, I saw it that I, I saw the the potential of the idea that if I give it away too soon, um, in the future I might end up regretting that I gave away too soon when the value was still less. So mm. I wanted it to grow to a better value. That when I give away stake in it, 
it, it is really worth it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. We're here to talk about quality education in general, but for us to do so, we have to define the existing landscape. Can you describe the current education system in Botswana? Um, looking at it, I, from my analysis, I would say it's, um, it's not very relevant. It's not relevant, actually, to the market needs, like even if you take it to the tertiary level you find that graduates come out and uh, they still have to do a lot of on-the-job training as opposed to, to where they graduate and they just have to do a little bit of on-the-job training. So it, it, it has so much gap in terms of practicality, preparing graduates to be work-ready. Okay. Yeah. Can you give an example of that in terms of your interaction with students when you say that they are, they are not work-ready? Um, we mainly hire, for, for example, when we hire center managers, we will look for someone who has done business administration or any business related course. And you'll find that uh, they would have learned a great deal of theory regarding management. But then when it comes to the practicality of the work that they have to do, we just have to prepare a six months program that takes them through what they're going to be doing and it will take us practically up to a year just to get someone to understand exactly how to function without so much support from uh, from us mm. okay um is it the problem with the curriculum or with the quality of educators who uh, who apply or implement that curriculum I think it's, the problem is with the curriculum itself. It, 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 it is more theory-based than practical. I wish if they could find a way or if, if it can be remodeled to, incorp to incorporate practical aspect that throughout a four-year degree, a student gets to have an attachment or a weekend job or an evening job where they get to do the practical of what they are learning Mm. daily okay and um, uh, in terms of the one-on-one -on -one tutoring which is one of the things that you are offering tell us the mechanics of that and how it operates um one-on-one -on -one, it is it's one method that we use because uh, some students are slow learners some students are have learning challenges or learning difficulties so for them being in a classroom with other students maybe who are fast learners it can be intimidating for them to ask to not to not come out when they don't understand and hence the teacher will just progress or the teacher will just progress with the content while someone is left behind so it allows that students to be with with a teacher or a tutor on a one on one basis and they are able to tell them when they don't understand and learn at their own pace okay I once interviewed your co-author for your book, uh, his name is Saidi Mdala, and he mentioned to me that uh, there's an element which you've introduced, which is personal development in your tutoring uh, institution. A, is that correct? B, how does that work? Yeah, it's correct. We, that's, uh, we would say that is our differentiation from everybody else. We, we do personal development to all our students. And the way we do it is such that when a student comes in, they go through the personal development program that we have set in place so that we prepare them mentally for learning. Because you'll find that 90% of our students are students who are retaking either Form 3 or Form 5. So already they come with uh, a defeated man mindset that they have failed, that they, 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 they have lost a bit of hope in order to succeed. So we, we start first with cultivating their mind to give them that confidence, to give them that uh, esteem to say, okay, I can do it this time around. I've been given a second chance, I can do it. So our personal development really is about empowering them to, to see their potential and unleash it. So is this to say that in addition to the classes that are offered from in the formal curriculum, you have extra classes for personal development? Yes, sir. Every student who does our full-time lessons they, they, they go through at least one hour every week of personal development. Okay. And what does that entail? In, in, in other words, what subjects do you cover uh, we, on personal development? On personal development. We start with purpose discovery. We help them to understand what, a purpose, what, the, what purpose is and how they can discover their own purpose for their life. 
And then from there, we take them through time management. We help them to understand study skills, uh, exam preparation skills. We just take them through all the life skills and we even incorporate business and leadership to say, okay, if you are going to study any career, have a mindset of being an entrepreneur that you, you don't necessarily have to be thinking, oh, when I graduate, I want a job. You can actually think around the skills or the qualifications that you have acquired and build a business around it. So we teach them entrepreneurship and we teach them leadership. Okay. Yeah. Now, does this um, teaching also uh, cover the tutors or the teachers who actually, uh, you know, uh, are hired by yourselves? And if so, how does that apply? We, they also go through a, a similar program at that level, which is, uh, is for teachers. We have a program, a personal development program for them that every week they, they, they have to go through, they go through some books, that, personal development books, and they meet up and they discuss them. And then there are some assignments that we also issue them. Where they take courses that help them to, to do professional development and do personal development. Okay. Just so that the viewer understands, can you give examples without necessarily mentioning names of how the program worked and helped a student? And then give another example without mentioning names of how it helped a teacher. Okay, I'll start with the teacher one. We have seen teachers who came, um, the person just graduated and um, they, they got to do this personal development program and it empowered them to a level where they would end up thinking differently and even franchising. So we'll find that most of... Franchising the, from you? From me, yes. You'll find that most of the centers are run by former teachers, former tutors, who were empowered through our programs and they started thinking differently and they started opening their own centers. Out of the 53, how many would you say were opened by former, former teachers? Over 20 of them are mm. former teachers. Okay. Yes, sir. That's very interesting. And, and how do you get them to open their eyes to see the benefit before we talk about the student's example? Yeah, it, it goes to teaching them about entrepreneurship, teaching them about leadership and management. So as they see, as they learn about those, they start imagining themselves as business owners. And when an opportunity comes for them to franchise, they take it. Mm. That's interesting. Let's talk about the students then. And then with students, we have had students who came with really results that are low, like a G. They will come G? With, yeah, this G. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you can get that bad. You can get G. Like for Form 5s, they will be doing double sciences of mathematics and they get, come with Gs, Fs and Es. Mm. So we would take them through this personal development program, empower them and teach them also the curriculum, the subjects that they, are, they came there for. And we have seen testimonies of students improving from a GG to an AA or a star star. Wow. Which are, those are the highest. What would have been the stumbling block? Uh, the, sometimes it's just that the students didn't believe in themselves because really the mindset is the factor in, in failure. Mm. Yeah, we, we deal with the mindset Predominantly, we, we will just empower them, transform their minds. And once their minds transform, they can learn. Mm. And, and the main thing is to, what, to show them the importance of purpose. Yes, once they discover their purpose, it becomes a motivation for them. Okay. Um, you do also have online learning. How does that operate? Uh, we use uh, common apps like uh, Google Meets, Zoom. So we just have st students uh, enrolling and then a tutor will facilitate it as a live session through mm -hmm. those platforms. Okay. And, and uh, does the student coming in have a choice? Can they decide whether to go online or in view of COVID or to do it one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, uh, they have all the options. There's mm -hmm. an option of having one-on-one, -on -one, there's an option of having online, and there's an option of coming to the tuition center to mm -hmm. get the service. Do you have an app for all this? I know that some of your competitors mm -hmm. advertise, say they have an app. Do you guys have an app? Our app is, is, is still work in progress. We believe that in two months' time it will be done. So we are, we are currently working on an app that is going to be similar to Netflix, mm -hmm. such that a student can learn 
on their own, that we have videos, we have notes, we have questions that are automated to mark themselves. Like the students will take a quiz or a test and the, it, the, the app marks it and gives them that results. Mm -hmm. So you just want it to, to, to be like a, and a, like, what do you call this? Um, an automated learning that yeah. students, if they wake up at 3 a.m. and they want to learn, they don't have to wake, wait for mm -hmm. anything. So you'd have a series of uh, videos already with lectures? Yes, we are developing them and mm. we are expecting to be done in two months. Mm -hmm. Does that really work in the long term without direct human interaction? It does because we, are, we, we also thought about it. We didn't, we didn't take away our students, but we looked at this that no, it, it wouldn't even take away our students. It's going to, be, it's going to complement our class. Because sometimes because of uh, some, some students being shy and everything else, they might use this app more to learn what they didn't, what the share didn't cover. And sometimes with school system where we know sometimes students get into the exam without finishing the syllabus, is also going to complement them mm. to be able to cover what they didn't cover at school and be ready for the exam. Okay. Mm. Is this what, what you call homeschooling or there's a different uh, sort of um, approach to homeschooling? Homeschooling really is the overall of what we are doing. Like if you look at uh, how we are doing, we are not we are not a convention, conventional school. So mm -hmm. the arrangement where parents bring their children to us to do this home, this full time learning, and we put it in a house setup, not the the traditional school. The whole model we refer to it as homeschooling, and there is also an option where we can say we can send a teacher to go and teach the child at the house, so a parent can opt not to have a child come to us or go to a conventional school, but they just have a teacher every day they come to the child's house and they teach them the same way they would have learned coming mm -hmm. to a facility. And have you, have you, um, are you beginning to see traction or results associated with that for, for homeschoolers? Yes, we, we have seen the, the results because uh, it really works for students who learn slowly, students who have learning challenges, it really benefits them a lot because now they get to have a, a, a someone who really focuses on them 100%. So students, all, all students, I have seen that they have the potential to learn and pass beyond expectations okay. as long as they are given enough attention. Okay. Let's take a moment just to talk about your books. Uh, what are these books and what motivated them? Um, I have the first one. It's called Success is a Choice. I Success is a Choice. Yes, sir. I specifically wrote it for students. It covers purpose discovery, study skills, time management, exam preparation, how to deal with exam fever, learning difficulties, learning styles. We just talked about everything in education that is a comprehensive guide for a student to help them know how to maneuver through their schooling years. So is it also prescribed for the personal development aspect? Yes, sir. it is the first book that when a student registered at Cricket, they get the copy of the book as part of the registration. And they go through the book and we take them through a personal development program through that book. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how, how um, can you demonstrate uh, its impact? Yes, we can because... Uh, we, giving an example of one of our centers being Cricket in Silver Pique. Mm -hmm. who have really religiously used the book to, to implement it and make sure that a student spend the first two weeks or the, the, yeah, the first two weeks of, they just go through the book, no lessons, no teaching. We have seen students, all those miracles that I was talking about, students coming from GGs, from Fs, from Es to A stars. It was because of that, it, it transforms and reshapes their mindset and gives them new hope that they can make it this time around. Mm. And would get, like with Pico, they got around 18 A stars mm -hmm. from students who, get, who, who previously had Fs, Gs, and Ds. So wouldn't that be your another, uh, you know, trumpet to blow, another differentiator about you that there's a book that guides? Yes, sir. Uh, competitors, I don't think, have written books. Yes, it is our differentiation and it has worked for us because even with the success of the book, it has sold over 10,000 copies. Mm. And that is a, a very big milestone for, for, for the local market mm -hmm. where we know buying books is not 
so common. People are not so much into reading. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the other books. Uh, the second book that I wrote is called Becoming an Entrepreneur. So as I was working with franchises now, I, I was also now compelled to write a book that can help them to understand what, it, what does it take to start your own business, to run your own business and grow it. Mm. So it's really a guide for entrepreneurs to, to in, in setting up a business and start growing it and uh, expanding it. Mm -hmm. Is it also prescribed, or this time maybe for teachers? Yeah, teach, our teachers take it, and but mainly is is the franchises, the the the, com, the business owners who are in partnership that mm -hmm. go take it. And, and then, how many franchises do you have? Out of the fifty three, yeah. forty six are franchises. Really? Yes, sir. You talked earlier about not wanting to give away equity, but now you've given away control. Yeah, um, I think that was the second idea. At the time when I needed to raise capital, I thought of maybe bringing an investor who has capital and give them equity in the business. Then I came across the idea of franchising, that franchising is like you are borrowing someone for a certain period of time, mm -hmm. but they still will bring in a capital that allows the business to expand, to grow. So that it was much a better option than giving away equity eternally. But this one is a temporary mm -hmm. equity given out. Normally, the franchises last for how long? We start with three years. And, and then after three years, they, after three years they return the we franchise? Can, we negotiate. Mm. If they were doing things well, complying with our, our operations and everything, we can extend for another five years. If after five In years, other words, if they're paying franchise fees on time? Yes, royalties <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on time. And the, the place is set up properly. There are no According complaints. And the results are coming out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, okay. we, we renew without any hesitation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a third book? The third book um, is, is just a, more like a biography, but it's not a comprehensive biography. Because your life is still going on. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah a lot there. of things happened after you wrote the book. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> you wrote it like, two years ago? <laughs> Um, that was three in, years. Three years ago, that was 2019, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it's like you're a different person. Yeah, there's, so much, three years, yeah, yeah. there's so much that can come out yeah. now. <laughs> I found when I was I'm in the middle of writing my book, but I find that as the chapters go, mm. the dynamics on the ground change and I yes. want to write more. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one should always have several volumes for their, for their memoirs or for their autobiography. Yes, definitely. There should be a sequel. Yeah, yes. the story keeps on changing. Yes. Mm. So how is the book doing and, and how does it fit into your personal development program for, for, the, for, for Crack It? It's also part of the, we use it for the, as part of the vetting that uh, someone who wants to franchise, they have to read it first. That's when we take them through the vetting process, mm. the interviewing that we do before. Have we, you found that people who hate reading never really make it? Yes, very yeah. much. Why is that? If you, if you don't read it, you never seem to move one inch. It's because reading opens up your mind to possibilities and uh, even to change. Because people who... Uh, progress is made by accepting that things have to keep on changing mm. for the better. So people who, who stay in one place without changing would not make it in life in anything. Some people would argue that, no, I don't need to read because I'm, I'm watching television uh, and I'm also on social media. What what would you say to such people? Um, I will compare it to, to, to food. Like when, when you watch television, it's the same as when you say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to cook at home. I'm going to just eat junk, junk food. Like I'm going to eat fast foods. I'm going to be buying fried chicken, fried, you know, if we eat fast food every day, yeah, mm. of course you're going to have energy. You're going to live day by day. Mm. But it's not the same as when you cook healthy, home-cooked meals, which is balanced diet. Mm. Yeah, so even the readership is like that. You, you can watch videos of good people who will teach about entrepreneurship, about growth, career success and everything. But it's not the same as when you sit down and read. There's more, reading is more spiritual than than watching a video or watching a movie. Well, I've discovered that it has to do with the eyes, mm -hmm. the connection between the eyes and the brains. As you are reading print, yeah. there's a different way in which information is recorded in your frontal lobe mm -hmm. and then retained mm -hmm. 
-hmm. from when we are just absorbing it in in other forms. Yes, sir. And there's a, that is why successful people like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates mm. set aside time. Warren Buffett says he spends six hours a day minimum reading. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Gates says he goes on vacation just to read. Yes, sir. And there are other examples like that. I, for instance, spend two hours mm. every morning in some form of reading. Yes, sir. So, so I think it's important. And the more people realize this, the better. So can you help me communicate this message, sir? Yes. Um, even from my side, I'll say I'll attribute the achievement that I have so far to, to readership. Because without the readership, most of the brilliant ideas that I've come up with uh, that I have implemented and have taken the business to the level where it is right now came from being able to read about stories of successful entrepreneurs and how they made decisions and how they did things. And I applied what works on my side. And without the readership, I would probably maybe still be running one location and just being there and even still teaching at that time. And, and it's a combination of readership and writing for in your case as well. Yes. Because you translated it to communication. Yes. Sir. Because what I found is that if you just absorb, 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 it has limited utility than when you apply and share. Yes, sir. And there's a dynamism that comes with sharing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Definitely, because even having getting speaking engagements to, to come and talk about business or talk to other entrepreneurs, it also does the, the communication aspect that even when you communicate what you communicate, it also builds you as an individual. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the pass rate. Um, uh, I suppose you want to compare it before your intervention and post your intervention. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know in what context you want to discuss the pass rate. Um, the pass rate really it was one of our main motivation to, 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 to scale in this tutoring industry. To say, okay, look at our Form 3 results, we look at our Form 5 results from the government schools. Every year the results are not impressive. The pass rate is very low. Even when you say a school is number one, it will be number one at 40% or 60%. And that, that is not quality. So we are, we are as cricket, we, we said, let's interfere in the education space and uh, bridge the government or be a bridge that can be coming in to support what they learn in school. Come up, we came up with revision books. We are coming up with this book, Success and Choice, all in an effort to say we can also reach out to government schools and help them to pick up their pass rate and pick up the overall country's pass rate. Mm. And, and it, it, Cricket has been operating how many years now? Is it six or seven years? Uh, it's five. This is our fifth year. Five, five years. But in the five years, would you say that you've had an appreciable impact on the pass rate for the country? Mm, so far, no. I would say no, because uh, the only places that I can say we made an impact is the schools that we, we adopted. There are some schools that we adopted, and then we started doing this personal development program using the guidance and counseling lessons, mm. or sometimes just getting students, gathering them in a, in, a, in a school hall, and empowering them and teaching them all this study skills, exam preparation skills, and it has, we would have, we would see a school tremendously improving. Like most of the project we did them around Francistown area, FSS, Tamaya, those villages around Francistown, we saw great improvement. They would get into the top 10 of, of that region after those, 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 those interventions. Yes, sir. Well, I think after this podcast, uh, people will be fighting to to be adopted. What is the process of adoption? How, what does it take? Uh, normally we do it from our side. We would look at a school that is not performing and then we would reach out to them say, okay, can we come in as a, as a partner and empower your students for exam success? So we normally select from our end. But if someone says, okay, we need that, we can always look at working mm. with them and helping them. Okay. And um, obviously it benefits you because you, are, you get more students as well to yes. come to your tuition center. It does because when we propose it, we, always, we, we, we become honest and say we also would love to share ourselves. We would love to market ourselves in the process. Mm. That is our only benefit that we would expect. We wouldn't expect any fees 
for why the, don't for you roll it out more widely or even countrywide that opportunity yes um we we want to do that sometimes maybe because of our hectic schedule mm. that we are limited in human resources to facilitate it as we would want but as we are growing we, 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 I think we, would, we have to get to a point now, we, we set targets to say, this year we'll serve this number of schools and then the following year we keep on increasing year by year. Speaking of growth, are you able to tell us the rate at which you are growing? How many new centers are open every year? Mm, I would say an average of 10 new centers every year. Mm -hmm. Looking at that, we began five years ago and now we are at 53. So mm. we, we are growing at 10 centers a year. Wow. And is there a target or as long as you're growing, you're happy? Yeah, we, we, we have a target, um, which um, I would say we will also have to, when we choose a location, there's, there are some demographics that we look at in terms of whether that location can sustain a business. We look at the population, we look at the number of schools and the student population in that area. So sometimes uh, the number of locations will hit a number that we will not go beyond looking at that fact that uh, we will not just open because there is no cricketing assistant location, but because can that place sustain our business model. Okay. Talk about student motivation um, a little bit. Um, student motivation, as you have already talked about personal development, is the main factor in getting a student to improve their results. Like when, when you are dealing with students whose results are not good and you want to improve them to the best results, really they need motivation. And as an educational institution, we have introduced motivation in different ways, starting with personal development and even going to extrinsic motivation where we offer rewards. For, for, from the classroom, we have rewards. We have rewards from the centers, and then we have rewards at the national level where we can give students cash prices, we can buy them tablets, we can buy them laptops, we can give them revision books, stationery, we give them badges, we post their names so that when they have succeeded. So we, we have put so many things to make students, every student to be motivated mm -hmm. to excel. Okay. And do they compete among themselves for this? for these things yes sir they mm. do the competition is very intense mm. yeah. and and you see this is where i have a, a difficulty because some parents or there's a school of thought that says we're all winners there's no need for number one number two mm. and and i i would argue that uh, healthy competition is very very necessary we can't all be winners yes sir yeah yeah yeah, it is it, it, it healthy competition. It, it works, especially among top performing students. It works because at the end of the day, we will have many students who who have excelled, even, even though there's going to be one person who gets the ultimate prize. But because of that healthy competition, you will have maybe several students getting A stars, hmm. which works good for our, our reputation and for the individual students. Yeah, and for the individual students. Let's yeah. talk about teacher motivation. And then there's teacher motivation. Teacher motivation plays a much bigger role, even more than student motivation. Because if the teacher comes into class and they're not motivated and they're not into it, really there's little or not much that many students can do. There are few students who can survive on their own, even given the teacher who is not motivated. But most of the students need a push, especially the kind of students that we have who are retaking. They really need the teacher's push. They need a teacher who is passionate. They need a teacher who goes all out and gives their life to them in terms of committing to their success. So if teachers are not motivated, it's really hard to get the results that you are looking for. Hmm. And how, 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 how has your, your track record been? Are you able to, for instance, give a practical example of, without mentioning a name, a, a, a teacher who was unmotivated, you did ABC, and then the result was um, beyond just the franchising that you yes, mentioned sir. earlier. Yes, sir. Yeah, we did. Um, we have cases of teachers that we took to, to masters in education. That has really motivated them to put more effort in their work because now 
they they don't now they, they they don't come to work as employees. They see that okay, when I come to work, I'm I'm coming to work, but also this work is also the one that pays for my school fees. We have mm -hmm. we have that program where we pay for that school fees. How does it work? Um, after one year, every teacher can apply for his, for a scholarship for any course that they want to progress in either a first degree or diploma or even for, 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 for masters if they have done that first degree. So we just say, okay, if you can be loyal with us for a minimum of one year, then we can invest in you and uh, you will work for us for some time. Do, this, do the students, I mean the teachers contribute to that via their salary or you'd rather just bind them, have a binding agreement, uh, bond them, so to speak? For them to work for you, uh, some of them they they contribute, and then when they finish, it means they'll be free. And then those who don't contribute, they have to work for us for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has that uh, affected your bottom line? Has that hurt your pockets as an yeah. em as an employer? It's very expensive exercise. Yeah, it is a very expensive exercise because uh, we didn't uh, anticipate that, like budget for it correctly. So it, it really keeps us uh, cash tight most of the time. How do you mean you didn't budget for it? You didn't think a lot of people will take it up? Yes, we, we, yeah, I think we, yeah. <laughs> we underestimated its cost, hmm. especially the master's program, because it is, it's the one that is really taking away a lot. But you're not about to cancel it? No. We just decided that instead of cancelling, we will let the first group that is, is on to graduate, then we open it up. So it, it, it will run, maybe not be there for next year, and then when those ones graduate after two years, that's when we open it up. So it will, be, it will come in two years periods. Typically, what sort of masters are they, chase, are they, are they choosing to do? And where are those masters degrees, uh, uh, you know? Which institutions do you have a, you know, uh, an arrangement with? Okay, they are doing masters in education, leadership, and management. Uh, and uh, we have specifically chosen by Isaho because of uh, because of the fact that we USE successfully negotiated a, a price that was um, discounted for cricket. So all our students who do masters they they do it via by Isaho University. And. Uh, it also, because they're doing leadership and education management, it gives us a pool of potential managers, administrators, as we are growing and expanding the business model. So it really helps us because we are investing in our growth in also that way. Mm -hmm. You want to say something about study skills? Yes, sir. Um, for students, really, this is for students. If you are, it doesn't matter which level a student will be studying, whether they are studying at a master's level, at a PhD level, or even at primary level. Study skills are essential to understand how to study and how to learn. So that is why all programs that we, for a student who comes to cricket, we take them through that and we show them the different study methods. And we say, okay, can you identify which one works for you? and stick with it and make sure you maximize it and improve your results with it. Because it's hard to do something without skills mm -hmm. that makes you to succeed. And study skills are what helps a student to succeed, to excel. Is studying an art or a science? I would say it's a science. Because it's, 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 uh, it's like, it's systematic, you know. You do one, two, three, you get these results. And there's no other way about it. What is that one, two, three? For example, if you, you, you study two hours a day, your results should improve. If you are studying using the right methods and you are doing, like for example, one of the study skill methods is SQ3R. What's that? Uh, SQ3R stands for surveying, which means gathering information. Q questions, you set up questions that are related to what you're going to be studying. You set your own questions. Then you read through the, the material. Then from there you review what you have studied and then you recite from your memory what you have understood. So for a student who does that with every subject that they are doing or every topic that they are doing, there is going to be a high chance of them succeeding because 
learning is just about the repeating things, repeating concepts, going them through them over and over again. So if a student is going to do that, I can put my head on the block and say they, could, they are going to improve their results, they are going to succeed. I had a method when I was a student where I would read first mm -hmm. and then after reading I would then transcribe, write down in my own uh, writing yes. and then after that I would then reduce the part I've written to notes, mm -hmm. briefer notes and then after that I would reduce those brief notes to cards yes. and that got me to be a, an 80 percentile and up yes, student yes. and uh, it seems to me that if I had been at cricket, I could have done even better. Yes, sir. Definitely. <laughs> what, what, what improvement would you have uh, suggested? Yeah, because uh, just to comment on that, you, you, you applied to study methods there. Mm -hmm. The first one you did was summary notes, which mm -hmm. is very effective because there's a link between writing and learning. Like there's a link between, you know, when you write things, they stick more than when you just read over them. Mm -hmm. So you did, and then you did flashcards. Those, mm -hmm. when you started putting it into small cards, those are flashcards and they're very effective for revision and comprehension of what you are learning. But you, you, there's more that I could have done. Which step did I miss? No, you didn't miss anything. I oh. believe you didn't miss anything. Okay, okay. <laughs> because because I, d I remember the Q and the G uh, you mentioned. Uh, the SQ3R. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's one method, SQ3R, and then another method is summary. For example, when I was a student, I used the summary notes only, and mm -hmm. they worked for me to be an A student. Mm -hmm. So you can just choose one of those methods and use it. Whatever, which one works for you, which one you have interest in, is the one that will work for you the best. Let's talk about the exam preparation. Um, is it a skill? Um, not really. I would say... Um, Talking about exam preparation is that students who don't excel in exams don't excel because maybe they are less intelligent or they are not gifted academically like some people think. It's really a matter of uh, exam preparation that how much time did a student give themselves to prepare for the exam? How much time did they give themselves to prepare for the exam? So a well-prepared student should be able to and to, to, to be able to answer all exam questions and even get them right if they are well prepared, if they studied ahead of time, they applied the, readings, the techniques that we just, some of them that we mentioned. But most of the time we get poor results because we don't give ourselves time to prepare for the exam. We shouldn't treat an exam like it's a coincidence that we, you know, you hear that there is exam is tomorrow, and then that's when you start preparing, when you start trying to memorize everything mm. and try to offload the following day into an exam paper. It doesn't work. What works is giving yourself time and going through the material over and over again. If it's mathematics, you go through calculations over and over again, work problems out. And then by the time the exam comes, you, it will be like you are just going through a paper that you are revising mm -hmm. because you understand what you need to put down mm. on paper. There are those who resort to a thing called cramming. Yes. How do you understand the term and, and how good or how bad is it? I don't recommend cramming because, as I mentioned, it's like you, 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 are, you are trying to memorize everything. You are trying to put all things into your mind, but which means you don't even understand. You don't even understand what you are supposed to be learning because learning at the end of the day is about... Okay, you, you have learned something, not just that you, you have to pass an exam. You can pass an exam by memorizing or cramming, but would you be able to apply that knowledge in a real life situation? We have seen cases of students who memorized content of Form 5, and then when they get to university, they can't survive the hecticness because there, there's a lot of application of what you have learned. So they, 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 they will be lacking that foundation of, of having to learn and understand the concept because they just memorize through mm. their basic education. Mm. Well, I've heard that being used as a, as a basis for explaining why people coming out of university are not ready for industry. Mm. Part of it is that they just studied to pass. Mm. They didn't study to earn or to work or to grow. Yes, sir. So uh, as, a, as a person steeped in the area, uh, am I right? In the, uh, is, is that theory correct? And, and B, what can be done about it? 
Yeah, it's very correct because that's what the challenge that I talked about earlier that we have students, you have someone graduating with a very good GPA. And then when you try to bring them in a real life, in a work situation, they have no idea what to do because they just memorized answers throughout their university years. And when they get to the real world, there is work to be done and they don't know what to do. Mm. So what can be done about it is to introduce the aspect of practicality. Like if, if we can have more practical uh, learning, practical learning where people go to the real life to work what they're learning, like uh, it, it should be contributing towards the, the overall mark. That if you maybe they can say 40% of uh, your final mark should, should be practical, it should be what you did in the field, mm. not necessarily that, not whereby you just only do one semester of an attachment mm. and where they, you know, sometimes you don't even get what you, you went there to do. You are just given clerical work there, which doesn't even prepare you for the industry. Yeah. Oh. We've re heard recently on radio that they set up a, a ministry of entrepreneurship. Um, is there a way in which this ministry has, um, has assisted you? Or is there a way in which you believe the ministry of entrepreneurship will impact mm. the ecosystem, as in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, as an entrepreneur yourself? What are your views on that? Um, uh, so far, we haven't... Uh worked with them yet or haven't come into contact with the ministry yet but I have heard about it and I was excited about it and I even said to myself if there was an opportunity to be a minister I would choose entrepreneurship over education. <laughs> Why? I would choose entrepreneurship over education because it's entrepreneurs are the ones who who can build the kind of education system that will take the country forward. So that was a very excellent move to introduce the Minister of Entrepreneurship. And given a chance, I would, I would, I would go for, for, for me, that ministry. For that ministry. You, you take a five years off to, to help with that ministry. Still, yes, and develop entrepreneurs and build industries in Botswana through that. Mm. Yes. And what are the main changes you would put into effect? I would, um, really, our biggest challenge is unemployment. And the reason why we are having a lot of unemployment is because uh, we import a lot of stuff. So if we could try to convince companies that uh, we are importing stuff from and even have quotas or even close borders completely to some products mm -hmm. and force them to be manufactured locally, it is going to open up a lot of job opportunities for, for, for the locals and we will have a, our economy picking up and coming to a level where it's, it self-sustains and we have locally produced products that are as good as the ones that we import over time. And that will really work for our GPD, GDP and development of our country. I agree with that. But also I think another idea would be forced lenders mm. to, to, to lend a certain percentage of their book, maybe 40%, mm. to indigenous, um, indigenous uh, entre entrepreneurs. Definitely. And to make it a, a mandatory requirement. Of course, all the other requirements have to be there. Yes, sir. If uh, the bankers have to assist those entrepreneurs in getting the basic skills mm -hmm. as a requirement, for instance, if it is a requirement that before we can lend you money, you should do a short course on management. Yes, sir. You should do a short course on entrepreneurship or something like that. Definitely. So it's one idea that I think would, would markedly change things almost overnight. Yes, sir. What do you think? Definitely, because uh, the other facts are really, because people have so many great ideas that can create employment. So the, the, the funding aspect, the capital needs to, to make those ideas come to life is one of the factors that maybe we don't have so many industries. If it was like that, you would mm -hmm. not have suffered mm -hmm. as much in getting started. Yes, sir. You had to, to <laughs> there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> And it's by God's grace that you are still you, you managed to get through the first one thousand days, you yes, know, sir. the first uh, two and a half years. Yes, sir. All right. What about learning disabilities? Um, we we have students who are learning disabled or learning, have learning disabilities, and sometimes uh, there are two ways about it. There are parents who would not know that some parents would have just have a child who is not performing 
and uh, maybe they will label them with bad names. For this child is a dummy, this child is, is a donkey in Setswana. They will just use those kind of words. And um, they very really, hurtful words. Yeah, very hurtful words. They really don't understand that this child needs to be helped. They need someone to help them learn in their own way. It's not like they, their, their future in learning is shattered. It's just that they are special. They need to be taught in a special way so that they can get to the level of other You students. mean like ch children with dys dyslexia? Dyslexia, please. yes. We have learned of cases of children who had dyslexia. We talked about like Richard Branson, hmm. they came from that background where they grew up with dyslexia. But today, look at him, he's a great entrepreneur because he, 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 they identified that and they admitted that because some parents will be in denial of that. We tell them the child has this challenge and they want to be in denial of it. They want the child to be put in the same class with students who are not having the same challenge and that doesn't work for the child in the long run because they need to be taught. So who helps you to diagnose things like that? I mean thinking even of autism as well. Yes sir. We have a partnership with Right to Learn. Right to Learn is, a, is an educational psychology clinic. Uh, it's run by Dr. Not Dr. Sorry. It's run by Ole mm Mepalahai. -hmm. So she's the, the psychologist behind it. So, so she does assessments of, our, of students, even not cricket students, just all students. Mm -hmm. And then she gives a report of how those students should be helped. Mm -hmm. A comprehensive. This is this is a special. This if it's a case of autism, this is how you deal with them. If it's a case of dyslexia, this is how you teach them. Mm -hmm. And that report helps the teachers to give the children the same education that they would have got. That is gotten by their peers who don't have the same challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you ever reject or not reject turn away students if they're for disability? Um, for, for example, for, for incapability to learn, or in other words, are there some cases, extreme cases, which where learning is not a is not an option? I would say no, because if we have extreme cases of learning disability, we give them directly to right to learn because they specialize in in uh, training students who have learning disabilities, and then when they get to a point where now they can learn now. Maybe they don't know how to read completely, they don't know how to write, or they don't know how to do mathematics completely. They would take them through that process until they get them to a certain level. Then they will hand them back to us to say, okay, now Cricket, you can take over and groom them. Mm -hmm. Now they can join a class that of students who are, don't have the same difficulty. That's, so, that's brilliant. That's commendable. Yes, sir. Now let me ask you the crystal ball question, say. If you grab the crystal ball and look to... Um, maybe a decade and a decade and a half going forward. What do you see? What comes out insofar as your brand, insofar as Cricket is concerned? What can we envision? Uh, I'm seeing schools, like we, 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 the same way we have tuitions all over the country, we, we should be having schools, Cricket schools. And, um, brick and mortar schools? Brick and mortar schools, yes. I'm just seeing the bigger picture. Why go that. back to something that you say doesn't work? Why don't you just focus on tuition? Mm, I realized that as much as uh, tuition was, it was coming in to complement schools, there's always going to be a need for schools. And uh, I, with our research, we, we, we believe we have come up with a way that a school should run, that it should bring out the results. So we are going to have schools and tuitions such that we can serve both markets because at the end of the day, there will still be people who will need a service of a school and then there will still be those who need a service of a tuition. So we will not... So it will be that, like a combination, a hybrid? Yes, we will mm -hmm. have... And even our school, the way we are going to arrange them, we are not going to make them to be conventional like the traditional schools, how they are set up. We want to set them in a way that they are interesting. They, students look forward to going to school mm -hmm. because it's a fun learning place. Okay, so how many cricket uh, schools can we foresee? And uh, are they just in Botswana or is it going to be regional, continental or international? Um, we, are, we have a bigger vision of going international. I would say um, we, are, we will take it step by step to see how far we will go. But in Botswana, really, 
because that's our base and that's where our strength is. We are going to to really do our best to transform into schools or to have schools side by side with the tuitions. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately we want also to have a university that if we, we, we groom the students as they graduate from Form 5, they should be going to a Kirkwood University that will just continue this learning and even introduce the aspect of practical learning that more our courses should consist of. A, 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 a big share of them should be practical learning that we prepare industry ready graduate. Most growth oriented um, you know, companies think in terms of listing in the stock exchange or uh, issuing shares to the public and that sort of thing. What are your views on that? Uh, that's our ultimate goal, really. We want to see ourselves one day to be listed in the Amazon Stock Exchange. So we, we, we are working every day. We, our vision is to build ourselves to be a company that can qualify to be listed. And are it, they, it are they, also are help they, us. the qualification requirements stringent? Are they tough? Yeah, they are very tough because uh, you have to be making, they said a million in profit for at least three consistent years. And then your books have to be well audited by a professional auditing company. Those are the key main besides the But you can, the, the you're already, but you're already <laughs> there. Yes, it's, it was, uh, you say that's our biggest goal now. We are mm. working on it. We are looking at three years, mm -hmm. uh, that two, we, in three years' time. Okay. We could have cricket listed, and that will help us with the vision of building uh, schools. And expanding. Plus, and expanding, yeah. And even in university, we can end up having a state of the art university with that capital. Mm. Oh. All right. This is the time now where you get to hit me with a question. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll just ask you this one. Um, as a business person, um, there is a lot of work. Yeah. No matter how hard you you try to, 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 to delegate work to other people that you have hired. Like, um, sometimes I, I have even gone to the extreme of bringing a CEO and saying, okay, if I bring in a CEO, it's going to help me to step aside and have a life. Hmm. But I always find myself to be buried in work. Hmm. So uh, my question would be like, um, is that part of the, the, the deal <laughs> or <laughs> there is another way about it that you don't, when you get into business and when you get to a certain level of business growth, you really get hooked into it that you don't have much life like mm -hmm. a, a person maybe who has a, an eight to five job. You have to, to, to sacrifice a lot in the beginning. Mm -hmm give up your time, give up your, your life. I mean, if I tell you the first 12 years of running Liruma Mohobi, I was the first to come in at 6 and the last to leave at uh, 11, sometimes 12, yeah. consistently for 12 years or so. So there is a, a stage in a, in a business where um, you have to sacrifice completely. Yes, Body, mind, soul blood, sweat, tears, everything. Even relationships. <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> but I was fortunate in that I had a, a good spouse who was, uh, mm -hmm. um, who understood. And, you know, at some point I worked with her for seven years. Mm -hmm. At some point uh, she started her own um, enterprise within our group. So she understood those kind of commitments. But a time comes when you need to liberate yourself. Uh, and you as a company that scales, part of successful scaling uh, involves uh, making yourself irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So you have to find your, a way of delegating. Um, looking for a CEO is one way, uh, but you have to know what that CEO is doing and you have to trust him. Uh, another way is to do what I've done, which is to say to empower my managers mm -hmm. sufficiently for them to make semi-autonomous decisions give uh, depending on the level of importance or the stakes involved that they only come to me with with big decisions mm -hmm. and then uh, i deal with them on a need to know basis if you know what i mean yes, i don't know necessarily have to know every little thing mm -hmm. that they are doing um and then i work with reports more than anything else so mm -hmm. i found that uh, yes i have to inject myself in but I do so less and less mm. by reason of the fact that I continually try to empower them. 
I have not succeeded as much as you have on the personal development uh, you know, uh, track in terms of energizing them and developing them to the level that I've, I've developed. But yes, sometimes you cannot force people to read mm. so that if people don't read, sometimes they cannot absorb the level of information you want to impart on them. Yes, so that one is a work in progress yes, to get them to fall in love with personal development as much as I have. Mm. But I believe that it's, it's, it's a work in progress. Mm. I don't need to do the eight to five anymore. But I certainly have to make myself available. Yes, I have dates on which I don't come. I have days on which I'm able to be away. Okay. Uh, but as I said, it's a work in progress. And um, it requires you setting a specific goal. By such and such a time, okay. I won't be doing this line of work anymore. Yes, I'm appointing so and so to do it. Okay. So it has to be something that you are intentional okay. and deliberate about. So I don't think your lot is uh, slaving away mm. forever and getting busier and busier. Yeah. Your lot is more training uh, managers and distributing and empowering them, mm. distributing responsibilities, yes. some of your responsibilities to them. Mm. I, for instance, used to have external um, accountants or chartered accountants. Mm. Having a finance manager within the organization has made a massive difference. Mm. It has, although I had already reduced my work burden, mm. I've done it even more so, yes. since now I have a finance manager full-time. Mm. But of course, you have to also watch the managers. Mm. So, so uh, you know, the answer that, the question that you asked me is not, is not a black and white one, mm. but, um, but it's, a, it's one of the toughest questions I've had to answer. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you understand? Error. Error, right, error. Right. Now that we have answered that tough question, Look at that uh, camera, sir. Yes, sir. And, um, and uh, just share something motivational, a take-home message as we wrap up our conversation. Um, to someone who is uh, aspiring to be in business, um, I would say though, when you have an idea, when... You, you you believe in your idea there's the 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 what do you call this the intuition the god the feeling that this idea can work is there don't let it uh, don't stay on it for the longest time because uh, sometimes when you stay with an idea for the longest time without bringing it to life without starting it it will slowly fade it will slowly die it will slowly uh, lose that excitement that it used to bring to you when you think about it, when you talk about it. So try to say, when you have an idea, find a way of implementing it as soon as you can when you still have the maximum excitement and the energy about it. Because if you wait too long, it will, it, will, it will slowly fade, it will slowly die, it will slowly disappear. And when you... When you try to implement it. Maybe someone would have already implemented it or something. You would have lost touch with the whole idea of how it's supposed to be done. But if you start, you can start somewhere a little small and you keep on growing, you keep on learning more about this idea, you keep on understanding it better, improving it, innovating it. So don't let your idea just, just die with you or just die in you. Yeah, I've read somewhere where Bill Gates yeah. says that if you do not act on an idea within 24 hours of getting it, it loses its power. Yes, sir. By that he means take a small step towards the implementation of that great idea. Yes, sir. Is it a phone call? Is it a letter? Yeah. Is it a meeting? Do something. Yes, sir. Don't just think about the idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, can you give them your contact details? Okay. Uh, for someone who wants to reach me... Um, I have a Facebook page, uh, it's Mohamed Senwelo. And then uh, for contact, if you want uh, to talk to me, you can get uh, an appointment via the Cricket office on the number 311-4821. Or the cell phone, you can use 7267-1267. Then we can schedule an appointment or even a speaking engagement or a motivation session for students. 
yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll be more than glad to, to come through that way. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful guest. You've done great things Thank this you, afternoon. Sir. You should be very proud of yourself. You've done well. Thank you, sir.